SECTION III. Of an Inquiry into the Caufes and Effects of the Variolae Vaccinae. By Edward Jenner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jordan Watts, Oxfordshire. Publication two. Further observations on the variolae vaccinae. Part two. The general symptoms which I have already described of the cowpox, when communicated in a casual way to any great extent, will, I am convinced, from the many cases I have seen, be found accurate. But from the very slight indisposition which ensues in cases of inoculation, where the pustule, after affecting the constitution, quickly runs into a scab spontaneously, or is artificially suppressed by some proper application, I am induced to believe that the violence of the symptoms may be ascribed to the inflammation and irritation of the ulcers, when ulceration takes place to any extent, as in the casual cowpox and that the constitutional symptoms which appear during the presence of the sore, while it assumes the character of a pustule only, are felt but in a very trifling degree. This mild affection of the system happens when the disease makes but a slight local impression on those who have been accidentally infected by cows, and, as far as I have seen, it has uniformly happened among those who have been inoculated, when a pustule only, and no great degree of inflammation or any ulceration, has taken place from the inoculation. The following cases will strengthen this opinion. The cowpox first appeared at a farm in the village of Stonehouse, in this county, about Michaelmas last, and continued gradually to pass from one cow to another till the end of November. On the 26th of that month, some ichorous matter was taken from a cow and dried upon a quill. On the 2nd of December, some of it was inserted into a scratch, made so superficial that no blood appeared on the arm of Susan Phipps, a child seven years old. The common inflammatory appearances took place in consequence and advanced till the fifth day, when they had so much subsided that I did not conceive anything further would ensue. Sixth, appearances stationary. Seventh, the inflammation began to advance. Eighth, a vesication perceptible on the edges forming, as in the inoculated smallpox, an appearance not unlike a grain of wheat, with the cleft or indention in the centre. Ninth, pain in the axilla. Tenth, a little headache, pulse 110, tongue not discoloured, countenance in health. Eleventh and twelfth, no perceptible illness, pulse about a hundred. Thirteenth, the pustule was now surrounded by an efflorescence interspersed with very minute confluent pustules to the extent of about an inch. Some of these pustules advanced in size and maturated. So exact was the resemblance of the arm at this stage to the general appearance of the inoculated smallpox that Mr. D, a neighbouring surgeon, who took some matter from it, and who had never seen the cowpox before, declared he could not perceive any difference. Footnote. That the cowpox was a supposed guardian of the constitution from the action of the smallpox has been a prevalent idea for a long time past, but the similarity in the constitutional effects between one disease and the other could never have been so accurately observed had not the inoculation of the cowpox placed it in a new and stronger point of view. This practice too has shown us what before lay concealed, the rise and progress of the pustule formed by the insertion of the virus, which places in a most conspicuous light its striking resemblance to the pustule formed from the inoculated smallpox. End of footnote. The child's arm now showed a disposition to scab, and remained nearly stationary for two or three days, when it began to run into an ulcerous state, and then commenced a febrile indisposition, accompanied with an increase of axillary tumour. The ulcer continued spreading near a week, during which time the child continued ill, when it increased to a size nearly as large as a shilling. It began now to discharge pus, granulation sprung up, and it healed. 
This child had before been of a remarkably fickly conftitution, but is now in very high health. Mary Hearn, twelve years of age, was inoculated with matter taken from the arm of Susan Phipps. Sixth day. A pustule began to appear, slight pain in the axilla. Seventh. A distinct vesicle formed. Eighth. The vesicle increasing, edges very red, no deviation in its appearance at this time from the inoculated smallpox. Ninth. No indisposition, pustule advancing. Tenth, the patient felt this evening a slight febrile attack. Eleventh, free from indisposition. Twelfth and thirteenth, the same. Fourteenth, an efflorescence of a faint red colour, extending several inches round the arm. The pustule beginning to show a disposition to spread, was dressed with an ointment composed of hydrogerum nitratum rubrum and unguentum ciri. The efflorescence itself was covered with a plaster of unguentum hydrogery fortius. In six hours it was examined, when it was found that the efflorescence had totally disappeared. The application of the ointment with the hydrogerum nitratum rubrum was made use of for three days when the state of the pustule remaining stationary it was exchanged for the unguentum hydrogery nitratus this appeared to have a more active effect than the former and in two or three days the virus seemed to be subdued when a simple dressing was made use of but the sore again showing a disposition to inflame the unguentum hydrogery nitratus was again applied and soon answered the intended purpose effectually the girl after the tenth day when as has been observed she became a little ill showed not the least symptom of indisposition she was afterwards exposed to the action of variolous matter and completely resisted it susan phipps also went through a similar trial conceiving these cases to be important i have given them in detail first to urge the precaution of using such means as may stop the progress of the pustule and secondly to point out what appears to be the fact that the most material indisposition or at least that which is felt most sensibly does not arise primarily from the first action of the virus on the constitution but that it often comes on if the pustule is left to chance as a secondary disease this leads me to conjecture what experiment must finally determine that they who have had the smallpox are not afterwards susceptible of the primary action of the cowpox virus foreseeing that the simple virus itself when it has not passed beyond the boundary of a vesicle excites in the system so little commotion is it not probable the trifling illness thus induced may be lost in that which so quickly and oftentimes so severely follows in the casual cowpox from the presence of corroding ulcers this consideration induces me to suppose that i may have been mistaken in my former observation on this subject in this respect as well as many others a parallel may be drawn between this disease and the smallpox in the latter the patient first feels the effect of what is called the absorption of the virus the symptoms then often nearly retire when a fresh attack commences different from the first and the illness keeps pace with the progress of the pustules through their different stages of maturation ulceration etc although the application i have mentioned in the case of mary hearn proved sufficient to check the progress of ulceration and prevent any secondary symptoms yet after the pustule has duly exerted its influence i should prefer the destroying it quickly and effectually to any other mode the term caustic to a tender ear and i conceive none will feel more interested in this inquiry than the anxious guardians of a nursery may sound harsh and unpleasing but every solicitude that may arise on this account will no longer exist 
when it is understood that the puftule, in a ftate fit to be acted upon, is then quite fuperficial, and that it does not occupy the fpace of a filver penny. Footnote. I mention escherotics for stopping the progrefs of the puftule, because I am acquainted with their efficacy. Probably more simple means might answer the purpose quite as well, such as might be found among the mineral and vegetable astringents. End of footnotes. As a proof of the efficacy of this practice, even before the virus had fully exerted itself on the system, I shall lay before my reader the following history. By a reference to the treatise on the variety vaccini, it will be seen that in the month of April 1798, four children were inoculated with the matter of cowpox, and that in two of these cases the virus on the arm was destroyed soon after it had produced a perceptible sickening. Mary James, aged seven years, one of the children alluded to, was inoculated in the month of December following with fresh variolous matter, and at the same time was exposed to the effluvia of a patient affected with the smallpox. The appearance and progress of the infected arm was, in every respect, similar to that which we generally observe when variolous matter has been inserted into the skin of a person who has not previously undergone either the cowpox or the smallpox. On the eighth day, conceiving there was infection in it, she was removed from her residence among those who had not had the smallpox. I was now anxiously waiting the result, conceiving from the state of the girl's arm she would fall sick about this time. On visiting her on the evening of the following day, the ninth, all I could learn from the woman who attended her was that she felt somewhat hotter than usual during the night, but was not restless and that in the morning there was a faint appearance of a rash about her wrists. This went off in a few hours, and was not at all perceptible to me on my visit in the evening. Not a single eruption appeared, the skin having been repeatedly and carefully examined. The inoculated arm continued to make the usual progress to the end, through all the stages of inflammation, maturation, and scabbing. On the eighth day, matter was taken from the arm of this girl, Mary James, and inserted into the arms of her mother and brother, neither of whom had had either the smallpox or the cowpox, the former about fifty years of age, the latter six. On the eighth day after the insertion, the boy felt indisposed and continued unwell two days, when a measles-like rash appeared on his hands and wrists, and was thinly scattered over his arms. The day following, his body was marbled over with an appearance somewhat similar, but he did not complain, nor did he appear indisposed. A few pustules now appeared, the greater part of which went away without maturating. On the ninth day, the mother began to complain. She was a little chilly, and had had a headache for two days but no pustule appeared on the skin, nor had she any appearance of a rash. The family was attended by an elderly woman as a nurse, who in her infancy had been exposed to the contagion of the smallpox, but had resisted it. This woman was now infected, but had the disease in the slightest manner, a very few eruptions appearing, two or three of which only maturated. From a solitary instance like that adduced of Mary James, whose constitution appears to have resisted the action of the variolous virus, after the influence of the cowpox virus had been so soon arrested in its progress, no positive conclusion can be fairly drawn, nor from the history of the three other patients who were subsequently infected, but nevertheless the facts collectively may be deemed interesting. That one mild variety of the smallpox has appeared I have already plainly shown, and by the means now mentioned we probably may have it in our power to produce at will another. At the time when the pustule was destroyed in the arm of Mary James, I was informed she had been indisposed about twelve hours, but I am now assured by those who were with her that the space of time was much less. 
Be that as it may, in cases of cowpox inoculation, I would not recommend any application to subdue the action of the pustule until convincing proofs have appeared of the patient's having felt its effects at least twelve hours. No harm indeed could ensue were a longer period to elapse before the application was made use of. In short, it should be suffered to have as full an effect as it could, consistently with the state of the arm. As the cases of inoculation multiply, I am more and more convinced of the extreme mildness of the symptoms arising merely from the primary action of the virus on the constitution, and that those symptoms which, as in the accidental cowpox, affect the patient with severity, are entirely secondary, excited by the irritating processes of inflammation and ulceration, and it appears to me that this singular virus possesses an irritating quality of a peculiar kind. But as a single cowpox pustule is all that is necessary to render the variolous virus ineffectual, and as we possess the means of allaying the irritation, should any arise, it becomes of little or no consequence. It appears then, as far as an inference can be drawn from the present progress of cowpox inoculation, that it is an accidental circumstance only which can render this a violent disease, and a circumstance of that nature, which fortunately it is in the power of almost everyone to avoid. I allude to the communication of the disease from cows. In this case, should the hands of the milker be affected with little accidental sores to any extent, every sore would become the nidus of infection, and feel the influence of the virus, and the degree of violence in the constitutional symptoms would be in proportion to the number and to the state of these local affections. Hence it follows that a person, either by accident or design, might be so filled with these wounds from contact with the virus that the constitution might sink under the pressure. Seeing that we possess the means of rendering the action of the sores mild, which, when left to chance, are capable of producing violent effects, and seeing too that these sores bear a resemblance to the smallpox, especially the confluent, should it not encourage the hope that some topical application might be used with advantage to counteract the fatal tendency of that disease when it appears in this terrific form? At what stage or stages of the disease this may be done with the most promising expectation of success, I will not pretend now to determine. I can only throw out this idea as the basis of further reasoning and experiments. I have often been foiled in my endeavours to communicate the cowpox by inoculation. An inflammation will sometimes succeed the scratch or puncture, and in a few days disappear without producing any further effect. Sometimes it will even produce an icarous fluid, and yet the system will not be affected. Footnote. At this point of the inquiry, I had not discovered the importance of inoculating with virus newly formed in the pustule. The reader will find this explained as he proceeds. End of footnote. The same thing we know happens with the smallpox virus. Four or five servants were inoculated at a farm contiguous to this place, last summer, with matter just taken from an infected cow. A little inflammation appeared on all their arms, but died away without producing a pustule. Yet all these servants caught the disease within a month afterwards from milking the infected cows, and some of them had it severely. At present, no other mode than that commonly practised for inoculating the smallpox has been used for giving the cowpox, but it is probable this might be varied with advantage. We should imitate the casual communication more clearly, were we first, by making the smallest superficial incision or puncture on the skin, to produce a little scab, and then, removing it, to touch the abraded part with the virus. A small portion of a thread imbrued with the virus, as in the old method of inoculating the smallpox, and laid upon the slightly incised skin, might probably prove a successful way of giving the disease. Or the cutis might be exposed in a minute point by an atom of blistering plaster, and the virus brought into contact with it. 
In the cafes juft alluded to, where I did not fucceed in giving the difeafe conftitutionally, the experiment was made with matter taken in a purulent ftate from the puftule of the nipple of a cow. Footnote. The caufe of thefe difappointments will be explained. End of footnote. Is pure pus, though contained in a small pox puftule, ever capable of producing the small pox perfectly? I fufpect it is not. Let us confider that it is always preceded by the limpid fluid, which, in constitutions susceptible to virulous contagion, is always infectious, and though on opening a pustule its contents may appear perfectly purulent, yet a given quantity of the limpid fluid may at the same time be blended with it, though it would be imperceptible to the only test of our senses, the eye. The presence then of this fluid, or its mechanical diffusion through pus, may at all times render active what is apparently mere pus, while its total absence, as in stale pustules, may be attended with the imperfect effects we have seen. It would be digressing too wildly to go far into the doctrine of secretion, but as it will not be quite extraneous, I shall just observe that I consider both the pus and the limpid fluid of the pustule as secretions, but that the organs established by nature to perform the office of secreting these fluids may differ essentially in their mechanical structure. What but a difference in the organization of glandular bodies constitutes the difference in the qualities of the fluid secreted? From some peculiar derangement in the structure, or in other words, some deviation in the natural action of a gland destined to secrete a mild, innoxious fluid, a poison of the most deadly nature may be created. For example, that gland which in its sound state secretes pure saliva may, from being thrown into diseased action, produce a poison of the most destructive quality. Nature appears to have no more difficulty in forming minute glands among the vascular parts of the body than she has in forming blood vessels, and millions of these can be called into existence when inflammation is excited in a few hours. Footnote. Mr. Home, in his excellent dissertation on pus and mucus, justifies this assertion. End of footnote. In the present early stage of the inquiry, for early it certainly must be deemed, before we know for an absolute certainty how soon the virus of the cowpox may suffer a change in its specific properties, after it has quitted the limpid state it possessed when forming a pustule, it would be prudent for those who have been inoculated with it to submit to virulous inoculation. No injury or inconvenience can accrue from this, and were the same method practised among those who, from inoculation, have felt the smallpox in an unsatisfactory manner at any period of their lives, it might appear that I had not been too officious in offering a cautionary hint in recommending a second inoculation with matter in its most perfect state. And here, let me suppose, for argument's sake, not from conviction, that one person in a hundred, after having had the cowpox, should be found susceptible of the smallpox, would this invalidate the utility of the practice? For, waiving all other considerations, who will deny that the inoculated smallpox, though abstractly it may be considered as harmless, does not involve in itself something that in numberless instances proves baneful to the human frame. That in delicate constitutions it sometimes excites scrofula is a fact that must generally be subscribed to, as it is so obvious to common observation. This consideration is important. As the effects of the smallpox inoculation on those who have had the cowpox will be watched with the most scrupulous eye by those who prosecute this inquiry, it may be proper to bring to their recollection some facts relative to the smallpox, which I must consider here as of consequence, but which hitherto seem not to have made a due impression. 
it fhould be remembered that the conftitution cannot by previous infection be rendered totally unfufceptible of the variolous poifon ; neither the cafual nor the inoculated Small Pox, whether it produces the difeafe in a mild or in a violent way, can perfectly extinguifh the fufceptibility. The fkin, we know, is ever ready to exhibit, though often in a very limited degree, the effect of the poifon when inferted there ; and how frequently do we fee among nurfes, when much expofed to the contagion, eruptions, and thefe fometimes preceded by fenfible illnefs ! Yet fhould any thing like an eruption appear, or the fmalleft degree of indifpofition, upon the infertion of the variolous matter on thofe who have gone through the cow pox, my affertions refpecting the peculiarities of the difeafe might be unjuftly difcredited. I know a gentleman who many years ago was inoculated for the Small Pox, but having no puftules or fcarcely any conftitutional affection that was perceptible, he was dissatisfied, and since has been repeatedly inoculated. A vesicle has always been produced in the arm in consequence, with axillary swelling and a slight indisposition. This is by no means a rare occurrence. It is probable that the fluid thus excited upon the skin would always produce the smallpox. On the arm of a person who had gone through the cowpox many years before, I once produced a vesication by the insertion of variolous matter, and with a little of the fluid inoculated a young woman who had a mild but very efficacious smallpox in consequence, although no constitutional effect was produced on the patient from whom the matter was taken. The following communication from Mr. Fewster affords a still clearer elucidation of this fact. Mr. Fewster says, quote, On the 3rd of April, 1797, I inoculated Master H, aged 14 months, for the smallpox. At the usual time he sickened, had a plentiful eruption, particularly on his face, and got well. His nursemaid, aged 24, had many years before gone through the smallpox in the natural way, which was evident from her being much pitted with it. She had used the child to sleep on her left arm, with her left cheek in contact with his face, and during his inoculation he had mostly slept in that manner. About a week after the child got well, she, the nurse, desired me to look at her face, which she said was very painful. There was a plentiful eruption on the left cheek, but not on any other part of the body, which went on to maturation. On inquiry I found that three days before the appearance of the eruption, she was taken with slight chilly fits, pain in her head and limbs, and some fever. On the appearance of the eruptions these pains went off, and now, the second day of the eruption, she complains of a little sore throat. Whether the above symptoms are the effects of the smallpox or of a recent cold, I do not know. On the fifth day of the eruption, I charged a lancet from two of the pustules, and on the next day I inoculated two children, one two years, the other four months old, with the matter. At the same time, I inoculated the mother and eldest sister with variolous matter taken from Master H. On the fifth day of their inoculation, all their arms were inflamed alike, and on the eighth day the eldest of those inoculated from the nurse sickened, and the youngest on the eleventh. They had both a plentiful eruption from which I inoculated several others, who had the disease very favourably. The mother and the other child sickened about the same time, and likewise had a plentiful eruption. Soon after a man in the village sickened with the smallpox, and had a confluent kind. To be convinced that the children had had the disease effectually, I took them to his house and inoculated them in both arms with matter taken from him, but without effect. End quote. These are not brought forward as uncommon occurrences, but as exemplifications of the human system's susceptibility of the variolous contagion, although it has been previously sensible of its action. 
happy is it for mankind that the appearance of the smallpox a second time on the same person beyond a trivial extent is so extremely rare that it is looked upon as a phenomenon indeed since the publication of dr heberden's paper on the varicelli or chickenpox the idea of such an occurrence in deference to authority so truly respectable has been generally relinquished this i conceive has been without just reason for after we have seen among many other things so strong a case as that recorded by mr edward withers surgeon of newbury berkshire in the fourth volume of the memoirs of the medical society of london from which i take the following extracts no one i think will again doubt the fact Quote, mr richard langford a farmer of west shefford in this county berkshire about five years of age when about a month old had the smallpox at a time when three others of the family had the same disease one of whom a servant man died of it mr langford's countenance was strongly indicative of the malignity of the distemper his face being so remarkably pitted and seamed as to attract the notice of all who saw him so that no one could entertain a doubt of his having had that disease in a most inveterate manner End quote. mr withers proceeds to state that mr langford was seized a second time had a bad confluent smallpox and died on the twenty-first day from the seizure and that four of the family as also a sister of the patients to whom the disease was conveyed by her sons visiting his uncle falling down with the smallpox fully satisfied the country with regard to the nature of the disease which nothing short of this would have done the sister died Quote, this case was thought so extraordinary a one as to induce the rector of the parish to record the particulars in the parish register End quote it is singular that in most cases of this kind the disease in the first instance has been confluent so that the extent of the ulceration of the skin as in the cowpox is not the process in nature which affords security to the constitution as the subject of the smallpox is so interwoven with that which is the more immediate object of my present concern it must plead my excuse for so often introducing it at present it must be considered as a distemper not well understood the inquiry i have instituted into the nature of the cowpox will probably promote its more perfect investigation the inquiry of dr pearson into the history of the cowpox having produced so great a number of attestations in favour of my assertion that it proves a protection to the human body from the smallpox i have not been assiduous in seeking for more but as some of my friends have been so good as to communicate the following i shall conclude these observations with their insertion extract of a letter from mr drake surgeon at stroud in this county and late surgeon to the north gloucester regiment of militia Quote, in the spring of the year seventeen ninety six i inoculated men women and children to the amount of about seventy many of the men did not receive the infection although inoculated at least three times and kept in the same room with those who actually underwent the disease during the whole time occupied by them in passing through it being anxious they should in future be secure against it i was very particular in my inquiries to find out whether they ever had previously had it or at any time been in the neighbourhood of people labouring under it but after all the only satisfactory information i could obtain was that they had had the cowpox as i was then ignorant of such a disease affecting the human subject i flattered myself what they imagined to be the cowpox was in reality the smallpox in a very slight degree i mentioned the circumstance in the presence of several of the officers at the same time expressing my doubts if it were not smallpox and was not a little surprised when i was told by the colonel that he had frequently heard you mention the cowpox as a disease endemial to gloucestershire 
and that if a perfon were ever affedted by it, you fuppofed him afterwards fecure from the Small Pox. This excited my curiofity, and when I vifited Gloucefterfhire, I was very inquifitive concerning the fubjedt, and from the information I have fince received, both from your publication and from conversation with medical men of the greateft accuracy in their obfervations, I am fully convinced that what the men fuppofed to be the cowpox was actually so, and I can safely affirm that they effectually resisted the smallpox. End quote. Mr. Fry, surgeon at Dursley in this county, favours me with the following communication. Quote, during the spring of the year 1797, I inoculated 1,475 patients of all ages, from a fortnight old to 70 years, amongst whom there were many who had previously gone through the cowpox. The exact number I cannot state, but if I say there were near 30, I am certain with the number. There was not a single instance of the variolous matter producing any constitutional effect on these people, nor any greater degree of local inflammation than it would have done in the arm of a person who had before gone through the smallpox, notwithstanding it was invariably inserted four, five, and sometimes six different times to satisfy the minds of the patients. In the common course of inoculation previous to the general one, scarcely a year passed without my meeting with one or two instances of persons who had gone through the cowpox, resisting the actions of the variolous contagion. I may fairly say that the number of people I have seen inoculated with the smallpox, who at former periods had gone through the cowpox, are not less than forty. Footnote. The greater part of these people must, of course, have had the cowpox many years before this trial was made upon them with the matter of smallpox. End of footnote. And in no one instance have I known a patient receive the smallpox, notwithstanding they invariably continued to associate with other inoculated patients during the progress of the disease and many of them purposefully expose themselves to the contagion of the natural smallpox, whence I am fully convinced that a person who had fairly had the cowpox is no longer capable of being acted upon by the variolous matter. I also inoculated a very considerable number of those who had had the disease which ran through the neighbourhood a few years ago, and was called by the common people the swinepox, not one of whom received the smallpox. Footnote. This was that mild variety of the smallpox which I have noticed in the late treatise on the cowpox, page 49. End of footnote. There were about half a dozen instances of people who never had either the cow or swinepox, yet did not receive the smallpox. The system not being in the least deranged, or the arms inflamed, although they were repeatedly inoculated, and associated with others who were labouring under the disease, one of them was the son of a farrier. End quote. Mr. Tierney, assistant surgeon of the South Gloucester Regiment of Militia, has obliged me with the following information. Quote, that in the summer of the year 1798 he inoculated a great number of men belonging to the regiment, and that among them he found eleven who, from having lived in dairies, had gone through the cowpox, that all of them resisted the smallpox except one, but that, on making the most rigid and scrupulous inquiry at the farm in Gloucestershire, where the man said he lived when he had the disease, and among those with whom at the same time he declared he had associated, and particularly of a person in the parish whom he said had dressed his fingers, it most clearly appeared that he aimed at an imposition, and that he never had been affected with the cowpox. Footnote. The public cannot be too much on their guard respecting persons of this description. End of footnote. Mr. Tierney remarks that the arms of many who were inoculated, after having had the cowpox, inflamed very quickly, and that in several a little ichorous fluid was formed. End quote. 
Mr. Cline, who in July laft was fo obliging, at my requeft, as to try the efficacy of the Cow pox virus, was kind enough to give me a letter on the refult of it, from which the following is an extract :" My dear Sir, — The Cow pox experiment has fucceeded admirably. The child fickened on the feventh day, and the fever, which was moderate, fubfided on the eleventh. The inflammation arifing from the infertion of the virus extended to about four inches in diameter, and then gradually fubfided, without having been attended with pain or other inconvenience. There were no eruptions. I have fince inoculated him with Small pox matter in three places, which were flightly inflamed on the third day, and then fubfided. Dr. Lister, who was formerly Phyfician to the Small pox Hofpital, attended the child with me, and he is convinced that it is not poffible to give him the Small pox. I think the substituting the Cow pox poison for the Small pox promifes to be one of the greateft improvements that has ever been made in medicine, and the more I think on the subjeft, the more I am impreffed with its importance. With great efteem, I am, etc., Henry Cline. End quote. Lincoln's Inn Fields, August 2nd, 1798. From communications with which I have been favoured from Dr. Pearson, who has occasionally reported to me the result of his private practice with the vaccine virus in London, and from Dr. Woodville, who has also favoured me with an account of his more extensive inoculation with the same virus at the smallpox hospital, it appears that many of their patients have been affected with eruptions, and that these eruptions have maturated in a manner very similar to the variolous. The matter they made use of was taken, in the first instance, from a cow belonging to one of the great milk farms in London. Having never seen maturated pustules produced either in my own practice among those who were carefully infected by cows, or those to whom the disease had been communicated by inoculation, I was desirous of seeing the effect of the matter generated in London on subjects living in the country. A thread imbrued in some of this matter was sent to me, and with it two children were inoculated, whose cases I shall transcribe from my notes. Stephen Jenner, three years and a half old. Third day, the arm showed a proper and decisive inflammation. Sixth, a vesicle arising. Seventh, the pustule of a cherry colour. Eighth, increasing in elevation. A few spots now appear on each arm near the insertion of the inferior tendons of the biceps muscles. They are very small and of a vivid red colour. The pulse natural, the tongue of its natural hue, no loss of appetite or any symptoms of indisposition. Ninth. The inoculated pustule on the arm this evening began to inflame, and gave the child uneasiness. He cried and pointed to the feet of it, and was immediately afterwards affected with febrile symptoms. At the expiration of two hours after the seizure, a plaster of unguentum hydrogery fortius was applied, and its effect was very quickly perceptible. For in ten minutes he resumed his usual looks and playfulness. On examining the arm about three hours after the application of the plaster, its effects in subduing the inflammation were very manifest. Tenth, the spots on the arms have disappeared, but there are three visible in the face. Eleventh, two spots on the face are gone, the other barely perceptible. Thirteenth, the pustule delineated in the second plate in the treatise on the Varioli vaccini is a correct representation of that on the child's arm, as it appears at this time. Fourteenth, two fresh spots appear on the face, the pustule on the arm nearly converted into a scab. As long as any fluid remained in it, it was limpid. James Hill, four years old, was inoculated on the same day and with part of the same matter which infected Stephen Jenner. It did not appear to have taken effect till the fifth day. Seventh, a perceptible vesicle. This evening the patient became a little chilly, no pain or tumour discoverable in the axilla. Eighth, perfectly well. 
9th. The fame. 10th. The veficle more elevated than I have been accuftomed to fee it, and affuming more perfectly the variolous character than is common with the cow pox at this stage. 11th. Surrounded by an inflammatory redness, about the size of a shilling, studded over with minute vesicles, the pustule contained a limpid fluid till the fourteenth day, after which it was encrusted over in the usual manner, but this incrustation, or scab, being accidentally rubbed off, it was slow in healing. These children were afterwards fully exposed to the smallpox contagion without effect. Having been requested by my friend, Mr. Henry Hicks, of Eastington, in this county, to inoculate two of his children, and at the same time some of his servants and the people employed in his manufactory, matter was taken from the arm of this boy for the purpose. The numbers inoculated were 18. They all took the infection, and either on the fifth or sixth day a vesicle was perceptible on the punctured part. Some of them began to feel a little unwell on the eighth day, but the greater number on the ninth. Their illness, as in the former cases described, was of short duration, and not sufficient to interrupt, but at very short intervals the children from their amusements, or the servants and manufacturers from following their ordinary business. Three of the children, whose employment in the manufactory was in some degree laborious, had an inflammation on their arms beyond the common boundary about the eleventh or twelfth day, when the feverish symptoms, which before were nearly gone off, again returned, accompanied with an increase of axillary tumour. In these cases, clearly perceiving the symptoms were governed by the state of the arms, I applied on the inoculated pustules, and renewed the application three or four times within an hour, a pledget of lint, previously soaked in aqua lethargery acetate, footnote, Goulard's extract of satin, end of footnote, and covered the hot efflorescence surrounding them with cloths dipped in cold water. The next day I found that this simple mode of treatment had succeeded perfectly. The inflammation was nearly gone off, and with it the symptoms which it had produced. Some of these patients have since been inoculated with variolous matter without any effect beyond a little inflammation on the part where it was inserted. Why the arms of those inoculated with the vaccine matter in the country should be more disposed to inflame than those inoculated in London, it may be difficult to determine. From comparing my own cases to some transmitted to me by Dr. Pearson and Dr. Woodville, this appears to be the fact. And what strikes me as still more extraordinary with respect to those inoculated in London is the appearance of maturating eruptions. In the two instances only which I have mentioned, the one from the inoculated, the other from the casual cowpox, a few red spots appeared, which quickly went off without maturating. The case of the Reverend Mr. Moore's servant may indeed seem like a deviation from the common appearances in the country, but the nature of these eruptions was not ascertained beyond their not possessing the property of communicating the disease by their effluvia. Perhaps the difference we perceive in the state of the arms may be owing to some variety in the mode of action of the virus upon the skin of those who breathe the air of London and those who live in the country. That the erysipelas assumes a different form in London from what we see it put on in the country is a fact very generally acknowledged. In calling the inflammation that is excited by the cowpox virus erysipelatus, perhaps I may not be critically exact but it certainly approaches near to it. Now, as the diseased action going forward in the part infected with the virus may undergo different modifications according to the peculiarities of the constitution on which it is to produce its effect, may it not account for the variation which has been observed? To this it may probably be objected that some of the patients inoculated and who had pustules in consequence, were newly come from the country, 
but I conceive that the changes wrought in the human body through the medium of the lungs may be extremely rapid. Yet, after all, further experiments made in London with vaccine virus generated in the country must finally throw a light on what now certainly appears obscure and mysterious. The principal variation perceptible to me in the action of the vaccine virus generated in London from that produced in the country was its proving more certainly infectious and giving a less disposition in the arm to inflame. There appears also a greater elevation of the pustule above the surrounding skin. In my former cases, the pustule produced by the insertion of the virus was more like one of those which are so thickly spread over the body in a bad case of confluent smallpox. This was more like a pustule of the distinct smallpox, except that I saw no instance of pus being formed in it, the matter remaining limpid till the period of scabbing. Wishing to see the effects of the disease on an infant newly born, my nephew, Mr. Henry Jenner, at my request, inserted the vaccine virus into the arm of a child about 20 hours old. His report to me is that the child went through the disease without apparent illness, yet that it was found effectually to resist the action of variolous matter with which it was subsequently inoculated. I have had an opportunity of trying the effects of the cowpox matter on a boy who, the day preceding its insertion, sickened with the measles. The eruption of the measles, attended with cough, a little pain in the chest, and the usual symptoms accompanying that disease, appeared on the third day and spread all over him. The disease went through its course without any deviation from its usual habits, and, notwithstanding this, the cowpox virus excited its common appearances, both on the arm and on the constitution, without any sensible interruption. On the sixth day there was a vesicle. Eighth, pain in the axilla, chilly and affected with headache. Ninth, nearly well. Twelfth, the pustule spread to the size of a large split pea, but without any surrounding efflorescence. It soon afterwards scabbed, and the boy recovered his general health rapidly. But it should be observed that before it scabbed, the efflorescence, which had suffered a temporary suspension, advanced in the usual manner. Here we see a deviation from the ordinary habits of the smallpox, as it has been observed that the presence of the measles suspends the action of variolous matter. However, the suspension of the efflorescence is worthy of observation. The very general investigation that is now taking place, chiefly through inoculation, and I again repeat my earnest hope that it may be conducted with that calmness and moderation which should ever accompany a philosophical research, must soon place the vaccine disease in its just point of view. The result of all my trials with the virus on the human subject has been uniform. In every instance, the patient who has felt its influence has completely lost the susceptibility for the variolous contagion. And as these instances are now become numerous, I conceive that, joined to the observations in the former part of this paper, they sufficiently preclude me from the necessity of entering into controversies with those who have circulated reports adverse to my assertions, on no other evidence than what has been casually collected. End of section 3section four of an inquiry into the causes and effects of the variety vaccini by edward jenner this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by jordan watts oxfordshire publication three a continuation of facts and observations relative to the variety vaccini or cowpox since my former publications on the vaccine inoculation, I have had the satisfaction of seeing it extend very widely. Not only in this country is the subject pursued with ardour, but from my correspondence with many respectable medical gentlemen on the continent, among whom are Dr. De Caro of Vienna and Dr. Bullhorn of Hanover, 
I find it is as warmly adopted abroad, where it has afforded the greatest satisfaction. I have the pleasure, too, of seeing that the feeble efforts of a few individuals to depreciate the new practice are sinking fast into contempt beneath the immense mass of evidence which has risen up in support of it. Upwards of 6,000 persons have now been inoculated with the virus of cowpox, and the far greater part of them have since been inoculated with that of smallpox and exposed to its infection in every rational way that could be devised without effect. It was very improbable that the investigation of a disease so analogous to the smallpox should go forward without engaging the attention of the physician of the smallpox hospital in London. Accordingly, Dr. Woodville, who fills that department with so much respectability, took an early opportunity of instituting an inquiry into the nature of the cowpox. This inquiry was began in the early part of the present year, and in May, Dr. Woodville published the result, which differs essentially from mine in a point of much importance. It appears that three-fifths of the patients inoculated were affected with eruptions, for the most part so perfectly resembling the smallpox as not to be distinguished from them. On this subject, it is necessary that I should make some comments. When I consider that out of the great number of cases of casual inoculation immediately from cows, which have from time to time presented themselves to my observation, and the many similar instances which have been communicated to me by medical gentlemen in this neighbourhood, when I consider too that the matter with which my inoculations were conducted in the years 1797, 98 and 99 was taken from different cows, and that in no instance anything like a variolous pustule appeared, I cannot feel disposed to imagine that eruptions, similar to those described by Dr. Woodville, have ever been produced by the pure, uncontaminated cowpox virus. On the contrary, I do suppose that those which the doctor speaks of originated in the action of variolous matter, which crept into the constitution with the vaccine and this i presume happened from the inoculation of a great number of the patients with variolous matter some on the third others on the fifth day after the vaccine had been applied and it should be observed that the matter thus propagated became the source of future inoculations in the hands of many medical gentlemen who appeared to have been previously unacquainted with the nature of the cowpox Another circumstance strongly, in my opinion, supporting this supposition, is the following. The cowpox has been known among our dairies time immemorial. If pustules then, like the variolus, were to follow the communication of it from the cow to the milker, would not such a fact have been known and recorded at our farms? Yet neither our farmers nor the medical people of the neighbourhood have noticed such an occurrence. A few scattered pimples I have sometimes, though very rarely, seen, the greatest part of which have generally disappeared quickly, but some have remained long enough to suppurate at their apex. That local cuticular inflammation, whether springing up spontaneously or arising from the application of acrid substances, such, for instance, as cantharides, pix burgundica, antimonium tartarizatum etc will often produce cutaneous affections not only near the seat of the inflammation but on some parts of the skin far beyond its boundary is a well-known fact it is doubtless on this principle that the inoculated cowpox pustule and its concomitant efflorescence may in very irritable constitutions produce this affection the eruption I allude to has commonly appeared some time in the third week after inoculation, but this appearance is too trivial to excite the least regard. The change which took place in the general appearance during the progress of the vaccine inoculation at the smallpox hospital should likewise be considered. Although at first it took on so much of the variolous character as to produce pustules in three cases out of five, yet in Dr. Woodville's last report, published in June, he says, quote, 
" Since the publication of my reports of inoculations for the Cow Pox, upwards of 300 Cafes have been under my care, and out of this number only 39 had puftules that fuppurated ; namely, out of the firft 100, 19 had puftules ; out of the fecond, 13 ; and out of the laft 110, only 7 had puftules. " Thus it appears that the difeafe has become con siderably milder, which I am inclined to attribute to a greater caution ufed in the choice of the matter, with which the infection was communicated ; for lately that which has been employed for this purpofe has been taken only from thofe patients in whom the Cow Pox proved very mild and well charadterifed." * In a few weeks after the Cow Pox inoculation was introduced at the Small Pox Hofpital, I was favoured with fome virus from this flock. In the firft inftance it produced a few puftules, which did not maturate, but in the fubfequent cafes none appeared. The inference I am induced to draw from thefe premises is very different. The decline, and finally the total extindion nearly of thefe puftules, in my opinion, are far more attributable to the Cow Pox virus affimilating the variolous. * In my firft publication on this fubjedt, I expreffed an opinion that the Small Pox and the Cow Pox were the fame difeafe under different modifications. In this opinion Dr. Woodville has concurred. The axiom of the immortal hunter that two diseased actions cannot take place at the same time in one and the same part will not be injured by the admiffion of this theory. End of footnote. The former probably being the original, the latter the fame difeafe under a peculiar and at prefent an inexplicable modification. One experiment tending to elucidate the point under difcuffion, I had myfelf the opportunity of inftituting. On the fuppofition of its being poffible that the cow which ranges over the fertile meadows in the Vale of Gloucefterfhire might generate a virus differing in fome refpedts in its qualities from that produced by the animal artificially pampered for the production of milk for the metropolis, I procured, during my residence there in the spring, some cowpox virus from a cow at one of the London milk farms. Footnote. It was taken by Mr. Tanner then a student at the veterinary college from a cow at mr clark's farm in kentish town End of footnote. it was immediately conveyed into gloucestershire by dr marshall who was then extensively engaged in the inoculation of the cowpox the general result of which and the inoculation in particular with this matter i shall lay before my readers in the following communication from the doctor Quote, Dear Sir, my neighbour, Mr. Hicks, having mentioned your wish to be informed of the progress of the inoculation here for the cowpox, and he also having taken the trouble to transmit to you my minutes of the cases which have fallen under my care, I hope you will pardon the further trouble I now give you in stating the observations I have made upon the subject. When first informed of it, having two children who had not had the smallpox, I determined to inoculate them for the cowpox whenever I should be so fortunate as to procure matter proper for the purpose. I was therefore particularly happy when I was informed that I could procure matter from some of those whom you had inoculated. In the first instance, I had no intention of extending the disease further than my own family, but the very extensive influence which the conviction of its efficacy in resisting the smallpox has had upon the minds of the people in general has rendered that intention nugatory, as you will perceive by the continuation of my cases enclosed in this letter. Footnote. Dr. Marshall has detailed these cases with great accuracy, but their publication would be deemed superfluous. End of footnote by which it will appear that since the twenty second of march i have inoculated a hundred and seven persons which considering the retired situation i reside in is a very great number there are also other considerations which besides that of its influence in resisting the smallpox appear to have had their weight namely the peculiar mildness of the disease the known safety of it 
and its not having in any inftance prevented the patient from following his ordinary bufinefs. In all the cafes under my care, there have only occurred two or three which required any application owing to erysipelatous inflammation on the arm, and they immediately yielded to it. In the remainder, the constitutional illness has been slight but sufficiently marked, and considerably less than I ever observed in the same number inoculated with the smallpox. In only one or two of these cases have any other eruptions appeared than those around the spot where the matter was infected, and those near the infected parts. Neither does there appear in the cowpox to be the least exciting cause to any other disease, which in the smallpox has been frequently observed, the constitution remaining in as full health and vigour after the termination of the disease as before the infection. Another important consideration appears to be the impossibility of the disease being communicated, except by the actual contact of the matter of the pustule, and consequently the perfect safety of the remaining part of the family, supposing only one or two should wish to be inoculated at the same time. Upon the whole, it appears evident to me that the cowpox is a pleasanter, shorter, and infinitely more safe disease than the inoculated smallpox, when conducted in the most careful and approved manner. Neither is the local affection of the inoculated part or the constitutional illness near so violent. I speak with confidence on the subject, having had an opportunity of observing its effect upon a variety of constitutions, from three months old to sixty years, and to which I have paid particular attention. In the cases alluded to here you will observe that the removal from the original source of the matter has made no alteration or change in the nature or appearance of the disease and that it may be continued ad infinitum, I imagine, from one person to another, if care be observed in taking the matter at a proper period, without any necessity of recurring to the original matter of the cow. I should be happy if any endeavours of mine could tend further to elucidate the subject, and shall be much gratified in sending you any further observations I may be enabled to make. I have the pleasure to subscribe myself, dear sir, etc., Joseph H. Marshall, end quote. Eastington, Gloucestershire, April 26, 1799. The gentleman who favoured me with the above account has continued to prosecute his inquiries with unremitting industry, and has communicated the result in another letter, which, at his request, I lay before the public without abbreviation. Dr. Marshall's Second Letter Quote, Dear Sir, Since the date of my former letter, I have continued to inoculate with the cowpox virus. Including the cases before enumerated, the number now amounts to 423. It would be tedious and useless to detail the progress of the disease in each individual. It is sufficient to observe that I noticed no deviation in any respect from the cases I formerly adduced. The general appearance of the arm exactly corresponded with the account given in your first publication. When they were disposed to become troublesome by erysipelatous inflammation, an application of equal parts of vinegar and water always answered the desired intention. I must not omit to inform you that when the disease had duly acted upon the constitution, I have frequently used the vitriolic acids, a portion of a drop applied with the head of a probe or any convenient utensil upon the pustule suffered to remain about forty seconds and afterwards washed off with sponge and water never failed to stop its progress and expedite the formation of a scab i have already subjected two hundred and eleven of my patients to the action of variolous matter but every one resisted it the result of my experiments, which were made with every requisite caution, has fully convinced me that the true cowpox is a safe and infallible preventive from the smallpox, 
that in no cafe which has fallen under my obfervation has it been in any confiderable degree troublefome much lefs have i feen any thing like danger for in no inftance were the patients prevented from following their ordinary employments in dr woodville's publication on the cowpox i noticed an extraordinary fact he says that the generality of his patients had pustules it certainly appears extremely extraordinary that in all my cases there never was but one pustule which appeared on a patient's elbow on the inoculated arm and maturated it appeared exactly like that on the incised part the whole of my observations founded as it appears on an extensive experience leads me to these obvious conclusions that those cases which have been or may be adduced against the preventive powers of the cowpox could not have been those of the true kind since it must appear to be absolutely impossible that i should have succeeded in such a number of cases without a single exception if such a preventive power did not exist i cannot entertain a doubt that the inoculated cowpox must quickly supersede that of smallpox if the many important advantages which must result from the new practice are duly considered we may reasonably infer that public benefit the sure test of the real merit of discoveries will render it generally extensive to you sir as the discoverer of this highly beneficial practice mankind are under the highest obligations as a private individual i participate in the general feeling more particularly as you have afforded me an opportunity of noticing the effects of a singular disease and of viewing the progress of the most curious experiment that ever was recorded in the history of physiology i remain dear sir etc joseph h marshall p s i should have observed that of the patients i inoculated and enumerated in my letter one hundred and twenty seven were infected with the matter you sent me from the london cow i discovered no dissimilarity of symptoms in these cases from those which i inoculated from matter procured in this county no pustules have occurred except in one or two cases where a single one appeared on the inoculated arm no difference was apparent in the local inflammation there was no suspension of ordinary employment among the labouring people nor was any medicine required i have frequently inoculated one or two in a family and the remaining part of it some weeks afterwards the uninfected have slept with the infected during the whole course of the disease without feeling it so that i am fully convinced the disease cannot be taken but by actual contact with the matter a curious fact has lately fallen under my observation on which i leave you to comment i visited a patient with the confluent smallpox and charged a lancet with some of the matter two days afterwards i was desired to inoculate a woman and four children with the cowpox and inadvertently took the vaccine matter on the same lancet which was before charged with that of smallpox in three days i discovered the mistake and fully expected that my five patients would be infected with smallpox but i was agreeably surprised to find the disease to be the genuine cowpox which proceeded without deviating in any particular from my former cases i afterwards inoculated these patients with variolous matter but all of them resisted its action i omitted mentioning another great advantage that now occurs to me in the inoculated cowpox i mean the safety with which pregnant women may have the disease communicated to them i have inoculated a great number of females in that situation and never observed their cases to differ in any respect from those of my other patients indeed the disease is so mild that it seems as if it might at all times be communicated with the most perfect safety End quote. i shall here take the opportunity of thanking dr marshall and those other gentlemen who have obligingly presented me with the results of their inoculations 
But, as they all agree in the fame point as that given in the above communication, namely, the fecurity of the patient from the effects of the Small Pox after the Cow Pox, their perufal, I prefume, would afford a fatisfadion that has not been amply given already. Particular occurrences I fhall of course detail. Some of my correspondents have mentioned the appearance of smallpox like eruptions at the commencement of their inoculations. But in these cases the matter was derived from the original stock at the smallpox hospital. I have myself inoculated a very considerable number from the matter produced by Dr. Marshall's patients, originating in the London cow, without observing pustules of any kind, and have dispersed it among others who have used it with a similar effect. From this source, Mr. H. Jenner informs me, he has inoculated above a hundred patients without observing eruptions. Whether the nature of the virus will undergo any change from being farther removed from its original source in passing successfully from one person to another, time alone can determine. That which I am now employing has been in use near eight months, and not the least change is perceptible in its mode of action, either locally or constitutionally. There is therefore every reason to expect that its effects will remain unaltered, and that we shall not be under the necessity of seeking fresh supplies from the cow. The following observations were obligingly sent to me by Mr. Tierney, assistant surgeon to the South Gloucester Regiment of Militia, to whom I am indebted for a former report on this subject. Quote, I inoculated with the cowpox matter from the 11th to the latter part of April 25 persons, including women and children. Some on the 11th were inoculated with the matter Mr. Shrapnel, surgeon to the regiment, had from you, the others with matter taken from these. The progress of the puncture was accurately observed, and its appearance seemed to differ from the smallpox in having less inflammation around its basis on the first days, that is, from the third to the seventh, but after this the inflammation increased, extending on the tenth or eleventh day to a circle of an inch and a half from its centre, and threatening very sore arms. But this, I am happy to say, was not the case. For, by applying mercurial ointment to the inflamed part, which was repeated daily until the inflammation went off, the arm got well without any further application or trouble. The constitutional symptoms which appeared on the eighth or ninth day after inoculation scarcely deserved the name of disease, as they were so slight as to be barely perceptible, except that I could connect a slight headache and languor with a stiffness and rather painful sensation in the axilla. This latter symptom was the most striking. It remained from 12 to 48 hours. In no case did I observe the smallest pustule or even discoloration of the skin like an incipient pustule, except about the part where the virus had been applied. After all these symptoms had subsided, and the arms were well, I inoculated four of this number with variolous matter, taken from a patient in another regiment. In each of these it was inserted several times under the cuticle, producing slight inflammation on the second or third day, and always disappearing before the fifth or sixth except in one who had the cowpox in Gloucestershire before he joined us, and who also received it at this time by inoculation. In this man, the puncture inflamed, and his arm was much sorer than from the insertion of the cowpox virus. But there was no pain in the axilla, nor could any constitutional affection be observed. I have only to add that I am now fully satisfied of the efficacy of the cowpox in preventing the appearance of the smallpox, and that is a most happy and salutary substitute for it. I remain, etc., M. J. Tierney. End quote. Although the susceptibility of the virus of the cowpox is for the most part lost in those who have had the smallpox, 
Yet in fome conftitutions it is only partially deftroyed, and in others it does not appear to be in the leaft diminished. By far the greateft number on whom trials were made refilled it entirely, yet I have found fome on whofe arms the puftule, from inoculation, was formed completely, but without producing the common efflorefcent blufh around it, or any conftitutional illnefs, while others have had the difeafe in the moft perfect manner. A case of the latter kind having been prefented to me by Mr. Fewster, surgeon of Thornbury, I shall insert it. Quote, Three children were inoculated with the vaccine matter you obligingly sent me. On calling to look at their arms three days after, I was told that John Hodges, one of the three, had been inoculated with the smallpox when a year old, and that he had a full burthen of which his face produced plentiful marks, a circumstance I was not before made acquainted with. On the sixth day the arm of this boy appeared as if inoculated with variolous matter, but the pustule was rather more elevated. On the ninth day he complained of violent pain in his head and back, accompanied with vomiting and much fever. The next day he was very well, and went to work as usual. The punctured part began to spread, and there was an areola around the inoculated part to a considerable extent. As this is contrary to an assertion made in the medical and physical journal, number 8, I thought it right to give you this information, and remain, dear sir, etc., J. Fewster, end quote. It appears then that the animal economy, with regard to the action of this virus, is under the same laws as it is with respect to the variolous virus, after previously feeling its influence, as far as comparisons can be made between the two diseases. Some striking instances of the power of the cowpox in suspending the progress of the smallpox after the patients had been several days casually exposed to the infection, have been laid before me by Mr. Lyford, surgeon of Winchester, and my nephew, the Reverend G. C. Jenner. Mr. Lyford, after giving an account of his extensive and successful practice in the vaccine inoculation in Hampshire, writes as follows, quote, the following case occurred to me a short time since, and may probably be worth your notice. I was sent for to a patient with the smallpox, and on inquiry found that, five days previous to my seeing him, the eruption began to appear. During the whole of this time, two children, who had not had the smallpox, were constantly in the room with their father, and frequently on the bed with him. The mother consulted me on the propriety of inoculating them, but objected to my taking the matter from their father, as he was subject to erysipelas. I advised her by all means to have them inoculated at that time, as I could not procure any variolous matter elsewhere. However, they were inoculated with vaccine matter, but I cannot say I flattered myself with its proving successful, as they had previously been so long, and still continued to be, exposed to the variolous infection. Notwithstanding this, I was agreeably surprised to find the vaccine disease advance and go through its regular course, and if I may be allowed the expression, to the total extinction of the smallpox. End quote. Mr. Jenner's cases were no less satisfactory. He writes as follows. Quote, a son of Thomas Stinchcombe, of Woodford, near Berkeley, was infected with the natural smallpox at Bristol, and came home to his father's cottage. Four days after the eruptions had appeared on the boy, the family, none of which had ever had the smallpox, consisting of the father, mother, and five children, were inoculated with vaccine virus. On the arm of the mother, it failed to produce the least effect, and she, of course, had the smallpox. Footnotes. 
Under similar circumstances, I think it would be advisable to insert the matter into each arm, which would be more likely to ensure the success of the matter. End of footnote. But the rest of the family had the cowpox in the usual mild way, and were not affected with the smallpox, although they were in the same room, and the children slept in the same bed with their brother, who was confined to it with the natural smallpox, and subsequently with their mother. I attended this family with my brother, Mr. H. Jenner. End quote. The following cases are of too singular a nature to remain unnoticed. Miss R., a young lady about five years old, was seized on the evening of the eighth day after inoculation with vaccine virus with such symptoms as commonly denote the accession of violent fever. Her throat was also a little sore, and there were some uneasy sensations about the muscles of the neck. The day following a rash was perceptible on her face and neck, so much resembling the efflorescence of the scarlatina anginosa that I was induced to ask whether Miss R. had been exposed to the contagion of that disease. An answer in the affirmative, and the rapid spreading of the redness over the skin, at once relieved me from much anxiety respecting the nature of the malady, which went through its course in the ordinary way, but not without symptoms which were alarming, both to myself and Mr. Lyford, who attended with me. There was no apparent deviation in the ordinary progress of the pustule to a state of maturity, from what we see in general, yet there was a total suspension of the areola, or florid discoloration around it, until the scarlatina had retired from the constitution. As soon as the patient was freed from this disease, this appearance advanced in the usual way. Footnote. I witnessed a similar fact in a case of measles. The pustule from the cowpox virus advanced to maturity, while the measles existed in the constitution, but no efflorescence appeared around it until the measles had ceased to exert its influence. End of footnote. The case of Miss H. R. is not less interesting than that of her sister above related. She was exposed to the contagion of the scarlatina at the same time, and sickened almost at the same hour. The symptoms continued severe about twelve hours, when the scarletine rash showed itself faintly upon her face and partly upon her neck. After remaining two or three hours, it suddenly disappeared, and she became perfectly free from every complaint. My surprise at this sudden transition from extreme sickness to health in great measure ceased, when I observed that the inoculated pustule had occasioned, in this case, the common efflorescent appearance around it, and that as it approached the centre, it was nearly in an erysipelatous state. But the most remarkable part of this history is that on the fourth day afterwards, as soon as the efflorescence began to die away upon the arm and the pustule to dry up, the scarlatina again appeared, her throat became sore, the rash spread all over her. She went fairly through the disease, with its common symptoms. That these were actually cases of scarlatina was rendered certain by two servants in the family falling ill at the same time with the distemper, who had been exposed to the infection with the young ladies. Some there are who suppose the security from the smallpox obtained through the cowpox will be of a temporary nature only. This supposition is refuted, not only by analogy with respect to the habits of disease of a similar nature, but by incontrovertible facts, which appear in great numbers against it. To those already adduced in the former part of my first treatise, many more might be added were it deemed necessary. But among the cases I refer to, one will be found of a person who had the cowpox 53 years before the effect of the smallpox was tried upon him. 
As he completely refilled it, the intervening period I conceive muft neceffarily fatisfy any reafonable mind. Should further evidence be thought neceffary, I fhall obferve that among the cafes prefented to me by Mr. Fry, Mr. Dark, Mr. Tierney, Mr. H. Jenner, and others, there were many whom they inoculated ineffectually with variolous matter, who had gone through the cowpox many years before this trial was made. It has been imagined that the cowpox is capable of being communicated from one person to another by effluvia without the intervention of inoculation. My experiments made with the design of ascertaining this important point all tend to establish my original position, that it is not infectious except by contact. I have never hesitated to suffer those on whose arms there were pustules exhaling the effluvia from associating or even sleeping with those who never had experienced either the cowpox or the smallpox. And further, I have repeatedly, among children, caused the uninfected to breathe over the inoculated vaccine pustules during their whole progress yet these experiments were tried without the least effect however to submit a matter so important to a still further scrutiny i desired mr h jenner to make any further experiments which might strike him as most likely to establish or refute what has been advanced on this subject he has since informed me that the inoculated children at the breast whose mothers had not gone through either the smallpox or the cowpox that he had inoculated mothers whose sucking infants had never undergone either of these diseases that the effluvia from the inoculated pustules in either case had been inhaled from day to day during the whole progress of their maturation and that there was not the least perceptible effect from these exposures one woman he inoculated about a week previous to her accouchement that her infant might be the more fully and conveniently exposed to the pustule but as in the former instances no infection was given although the child frequently slept on the arm of its mother with its nostrils and mouth exposed to the pustule in the fullest state of maturity in a word is it not impossible for the cowpox whose only manifestation appears to consist in the pustules created by contact to produce itself by effluvia in the course of a late inoculation i observed an appearance which it may be proper here to relate the punctured part on a boy's arm who was inoculated with fresh limpid virus on the sixth day instead of showing a beginning vesicle which is usual in the cowpox at that period was encrusted over with a rugged amber-coloured scab the scab continued to spread and increase in thickness for some days when at its edges a vesicated ring appeared and the disease went through its ordinary course the boy having had soreness in the axilla and some slight indisposition with the fluid matter taken from the arm five persons were inoculated in one it took no effect in another it produced a perfect pustule without any deviation from the common appearance but in the other three the progress of the inflammation was exactly similar to the instance which afforded the virus for their inoculation there was a creeping scab of a loose texture and subsequently the formation of limpid fluid at its edges as these people were all employed in laborious exercises it is possible that these anomalous appearances might owe their origin to the friction of the clothes on the newly inflamed part of the arm i have not yet had an opportunity of exposing them to the smallpox in the early part of this inquiry i felt far more anxious respecting the inflammation of the inoculated arm than at present yet that this affection will go on to a greater extent than could be wished is a circumstance sometimes to be expected as this can be checked or even entirely subdued by very simple means 
I fee no reafon why the patient fhould feel an uneafy hour, becaufe an application may not be abfolutely neceffary. About the tenth or eleventh day, if the puftule has proceeded regularly, the appearance of the arm will almoft to a certainty indicate whether this is to be expected or not. Should it happen, nothing more need be done than to apply a single drop of the aqua lithargery acetati footnote, extract of satin, end of footnote, upon the pustule, and having suffered it to remain two or three minutes, to cover the efflorescence surrounding the pustule with a piece of linen dipped in aqua lithargery composita, footnote, goulard water. For further information on this subject, see the first treatise on the variety vaccini, Dr. Marshall's letters, etc. End of footnotes. The former may be repeated twice or thrice during the day, the latter as often as it may feel agreeable to the patient. When the scab is prematurely rubbed off, a circumstance not unfrequent among children and working people, the application of a little aqua lethargery acetati to the part immediately coagulates the surface, which supplies its place and prevents a sore. In my former treatises on this subject, I have remarked that the human constitution frequently retains its susceptibility of the smallpox contagion, both from effluvia and contact, after previously feeling its influence. In further corroboration of this declaration, many facts have been communicated to me by various correspondents. I shall select one of them. Quote, Dear Sir, Society at large must, I think, feel much indebted to you for your inquiries and observations on the nature and effects of the variety vaccini, etc., etc. As I conceive what I am now about to communicate to be of some importance, I imagine it cannot be uninteresting to you, especially as it will serve to corroborate your assertion on the susceptibility of the human system of the variolous contagion, although it has previously been made sensible of its action. In November 1793, I was desired to inoculate a person with the smallpox. I took the variolous matter from a child under the disease in the natural way, who had a large burden of distinct pustules. The mother of the child, being desirous of seeing my method of communicating the disease by inoculation, after having opened a pustule, I introduced the point of my lancet in the usual way on the back part of my own hand, and thought no more of it until I felt a sensation in the part, which reminded me of the transaction. This happened upon the third day. On the fourth, there were all the appearances common to inoculation, at which I was not at all surprised, nor did I feel myself uneasy upon perceiving the inflammation continued to increase to the sixth and seventh day, accompanied with a very small quantity of fluid. Repeated experiments having taught me it might happen so with persons who had undergone the disease and yet would escape any constitutional affection. But I was not so fortunate, for on the eighth day I was seized with all the symptoms of the eruptive fever, but in a much more violent degree than when I was before inoculated, which was about eighteen years previous to this, when I had a considerable number of pustules. I must confess I was now greatly alarmed, although I had been much engaged in the smallpox, having at different times inoculated not less than two thousand persons. I was convinced that my present indisposition proceeded from the insertion of the variolous matter, and therefore anxiously looked for an eruption. On the tenth day I felt a very unpleasant sensation of stiffness and heat on each side of my face near the ear, and the fever began to decline. The affection in my face soon terminated in three or four pustules attended with inflammation, but which did not maturate, and I was presently well. I remain, dear sir, etc., Thomas Miles. End quote. This inquiry is not now so much 
in its infancy as to reftrain me from fpeaking more pofitively than formerly on the important points of fcrophula, as connected with the Small Pox. Every practitioner in medicine who has extenfively inoculated with the Small Pox, or who has attended many of those who have had the diftemper in the natural way, muft acknowledge that he has frequently seen scrofulous affections in some form or another sometimes rather quickly showing themselves after the recovery of the patients conceiving this fact to be admitted as i presumed it must be by all who have carefully attended to the subject may i not ask whether it does not appear probable that the general introduction of the smallpox into europe has not been among the most conducive means in exciting that formidable foe to health having attentively watched the effects of the cowpox in this respect i am happy in being able to declare that the disease does not appear to have the least tendency to produce this destructive malady the scepticism that appeared even among the most enlightened of medical men when my sentiments on the important subject of the cowpox were first promulgated was highly laudable to have admitted the truth of a doctrine at once so novel and so unlike anything that had ever appeared in the annals of medicine without the test of the most rigid scrutiny would have bordered upon temerity but now when that scrutiny has taken place not only among ourselves but in the first professional circles in europe and when it has been uniformly found in such abundant instances that the human frame when once it has felt the influence of the genuine cowpox in the way that has been described it is never afterwards at any period of its existence assailable by the smallpox may i not with perfect confidence congratulate my country and society at large on their beholding in the mild form of the cowpox an antidote that is capable of extirpating from the earth a disease which is every hour devouring its victims a disease that has ever been considered as the severest scourge of the human race Finis. End of section four. End of an inquiry into the causes and effects of the Varali vaccini by Edward Jenner.